All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our webinar about the Great Backyard Bird Count. I do want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, so we will make this recording available on our YouTube channel and we'll send out an email to you um, probably by the end of this week with a link to the recording. So don't feel like you have to scramble and take notes. You can always come back to it and revisit it, and we'll be sure to share with you relevant links as well. These days, we're all probably feeling pretty familiar with online platforms, but in case Zoom isn't your program of choice, I just want to go over a couple of things first. I generally recommend that you exit full screen so that you can dock the chat window to the side. We often have opportunities to chat amongst ourselves and with each other and be interactive as we go through these webinars, so we'd love for you to join us that way. So to do that, you're going to want to find the chat window icon, it looks like a little speech bubble, click on that, and then over here, right above where you type your text, you're going to want to make sure it says to everyone. That means everyone in the session will be able to see what you're saying, so we can be more collaborative and you can share idea ideas with each other. So my name is Kelly and I'm coming to you from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. Specifically, I'm with the K-12 education team where our mission is to create innovative resources and trainings that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. And I am joined by Stephanie in the chat window tonight. Um, she'll be sharing links and helping answer questions or flag me down to answer questions. So um, feel free to chat with Steph there. Um, and really excited to have you with us tonight. It's about a month before the Great Backyard Bird Count, so it's a good time to start planning. And if you aren't too familiar with the K-12 education team from the lab, we have a number of ways that we achieve our mission. We create curriculum resources, so everything from simple downloadable free activities to do just to get kids outside and exploring nature, all the way up to full science kits um, and science units. We also do educator training, both online and in person. And this is part of our monthly webinar series where we talk about different timely subjects. All of our resources and trainings hit on one or more of these three main pillars, nature connection, citizen science, and inquiry investigations. So we really are all about getting kids outside, using birds as a hook, um, and getting kids to participate in citizen science and even into inquiry where they're asking and answering their own questions in science. And both of these are ways to experience science um, by practicing science, by doing science. And we will be talking about citizen science some today as the Great Backyard Bird Count is one of our citizen science projects here at the lab. So when I think about the power of citizen science, I think about it as the ability to help change kids' science identity. And what I mean by science identity is how kids perceive themselves in relation to science. That's kind of important to me because usually when you ask kids to picture a scientist or draw a scientist, you get something like this. Um, a guy in a lab coat with beakers and equations. Sometimes there's crazy Einstein hair. This time we've got a really excellent mustache. Um, and this is this is science, right? But it's maybe a narrow conception of science. And we want to broaden kids' idea of what science is and who can do science. We want them to view these folks as scientists, people who are outside observing the natural world, asking an answer questions and helping us understand how the world works. And then to this, we want them to view themselves as scientists and practice doing the things that scientists do. 
So in this webinar, we're going to discuss citizen science and help it, how it can help us achieve some of those things. We'll introduce you to the Great Backyard Burke Count, going over some of the history of the count um, and ways that you can participate. We'll share some activities that can help you prepare to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count while building some excitement and skills. And then I'll give you a quick introduction to the Merlin Bird ID app, which is a really useful tool if you are beginning to engage with kids in bird watching. So before we get too much further, I've said citizen science like a dozen times already. So let's take a moment to define it together. What are some key words or definitions or projects that spring to your mind when you hear the phrase citizen science? Kelly, we have someone raising their hand, Corinne Jackman. Uh, yeah, Corinne, if you wanna just um, add a question into the chat window, that would be great. Wendy's saying that anyone can contribute data. Kathleen's saying community. Dawn's bringing up pro um, Project Frog Watch. That's a fun one. I'm seeing data connection, lots of observation, science that is accessible to anyone. Some more projects like iNaturalist are coming up. I'm seeing ideas of um, community and um, things that are local to you. Somebody brought up eBird, awesome. Okay, so this is so exciting for me. <laughs> I feel like when I first started working at the lab like seven years ago now, when I asked this question, there wasn't quite this outflow of information. And what I'm seeing from you all is all ringing really true. You're bringing up great projects and you're bringing up great points. When I think of citizen science, I think of it as a partnership between regular folks like you and me who aren't scientists and the kids that we work with. Um, and professional scientists to share our observations and help answer real world questions. So in sci citizen science, people report their observations using basic scientific protocols to databases that scientists can then use to answer these big important questions. I like this graphic here as an image of citizen science because I think it encapsulate, encapsulates, excuse me, the wide variety of projects that are out there. They can be totally online or totally outside. They can be very locally focused or globally focused. They can be on the scale of the universe or the microscopic. So anything that you are interested in, there's probably a citizen science project out there related to it, which is great for when you're working with kids and students, you can find things that match their interests. So as I mentioned before, these are projects in which folks volunteer to help real world science, excuse me, to help professional scientists answer real world questions. And what's so amazing and motivating about this for students is that they know their data really matters. So they know that the information they're collecting is going someplace and being used and helping understand our world just a little bit better. And it's great for us as educators and great for the kids that we work with. It really, participating in citizen science really helps us meet our science and learning standards. Kids are getting hands-on experience with parts of the scientific process and parts of the NGSS science practices that you see um, reflecting the science practice, uh, excuse me, the process of investigation. It's exciting and real world. It provides you with a relatively low cost year round way to study wild animals and build a connection to your local environment. And if you're lucky, spark a lifelong interest in your students and really capture their curiosity. 
And as I mentioned, there are a wealth of projects out there for you. So if you love the idea of citizen science, but you think maybe your students would connect more through insects or plants or stars, I highly encourage you to explore the breadth of citizen science projects out there and find the right one for you. And to help you do that, there's tons of amazing resources. I recommend these two as places to look if you're starting your citizen science journey. There's citizenscience.org for the Citizen Science Association. And then there's scistarter.org. This one is really fantastic to help you search through different projects. And I'll ask um, Steph to share links to these in the chat window. So scistarter.org, you can search for projects based on location, based on the age groups of kids you're working at with, whether or not you want the project to be indoor or outdoor, lots of really good opportunities and options for you there. Here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, our citizen science projects follow very similar protocols, getting outside, identifying and observing birds, collecting your data, entering your data online. And then what's really special about uh, the lab citizen science projects is that you can then retrieve and view that data. So it's your data too. You can look at it. You can see the data that people are submitting from all over the world. So now let's dive into the Great Backyard Bird Count, the event of the evening and the citizen science project that coming up in February. So this is a really wonderful way to begin exploring citizen science as something that you can do with your students. It's a four day event that takes place every February. The dates do shift a, lot of, a little from year to year because it follows um, what's typically President's Day weekend. So that Friday, the 17th in this case, um, you, you have at least one day overlapping with most school events, or excuse me, with most school calendars. And then that it goes through to Monday, which I think most schools have off as a holiday. But you do have at least one day in the classroom where you could participate in this project, and then you could send the kids off to try in their own homes and neighborhoods. So we really view the Great Backyard Bird Count as four days in which we can celebrate watching birds and counting birds, and it's a project that you can participate in from anywhere. And I wanted to give you a little history of the Great Backyard Bird Count because I think it's pretty cool. This is one of our older citizen science projects and it actually predates eBird for those of you familiar with that project. And it kind of came about to answer this question, will people watch birds, record what they see and then report their sightings to us? It's not a known question at the time and we wanted to take advantage or partner with really is a better way to think of it. All those people out there who are already watching birds so that we could collect this data and do important conservation work that we all care about. So the answer to that question, will people report their sightings and share them with us was yes. And we figured it might be because, hey, we know birds are pretty cute. They're pretty fun to watch. And we know that people spend time out there watching them. And so when we put it to them that they could share their data with us, we were surprised by how enthusiastic the response was. So this was originally launched in 1998 by Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the National Audubon Society in North America only. And it was our first online citizen science or community science, you might be familiar with that term, project collecting data and displaying the results in almost real time. So that's pretty exciting. Um, these days it is almost exactly real time. It's very, very fast that you can then see the data that people are submitting. And the positive results that we got from the Great Bag Year backyard bird count and how enthusiastic people were to participate and the great data that they were sharing with us led us to create eBird, which is our largest citizen science project now with more than a billion observations. 
Um, so it really was a pioneering project. It really changed the way we thought about how we could partner with the public to better understand birds and led to kind of an era of amazing data collection and sharing of knowledge. In 2009, Birds Canada joined in the project and we were able to bring in a whole new audience to participate and join us in this project. And now the Great Backyard Bird Count can be participated in from across the world and uses the eBird portal to collect its data, which um, that global process began in 2013. And it really is global. So this image I love, it is a GIF showing us, or an animation I should say, showing us bird sightings throughout 24 hours. And you can see how as the daylight shifts, these sightings come to life. And there's people from all over the world submitting data through eBird. So every point of light is a submission to the eBird database. So by the numbers, the Great Backyard Bird Count in 2022 was pretty impressive. There were more than 384,000 participants identifying 7,000 bird species and submitting roughly 360,000 eBird checklists and making nearly 300,000 Merlin bird ID. So you can see that this is a really powerful project. It's a growing project. Um, every year it's growing. So I think we had almost 80,000 more participants this year, which is really exciting. All right, so what is it? How does it work? What do you do? To participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count, all you need to do is watch and count birds anywhere for at least 15 minutes during that, those four days. Um, you can certainly count for more than 15 minutes. You can count on more than one day, but just one 15 minute count during that four day period means you have participated in the Great Backyard Bird Count. What you'll want to do is keep track of your time and location. So when did you start birding? How long were you out there? Um, and where were you watching birds? As you are counting different bird species, you're gonna to wanna to keep track of your best estimate of the number of individuals for each species that you see. And this can be maybe a little tricky because if you've ever watched a chickadee or a titmouse at a feeder, you know, they might fly in and grab one seed and then fly out and fly in and grab another one. So it can be hard sometimes to estimate the numbers, but really we're just asking that you do your best estimate of what you see. And if you're out like taking a walk or something, um, keeping a tally is a really great way to do that. So it doesn't have to be super complicated. Just do your very best to estimate the numbers that you see. Uh, we often get asked like, how does the data work? Can I enter just one bird? Do I have to enter the list right away? Um, so entering one bird is totally fine. Entering more than one bird is awesome. It's just whatever you happen to see in those 15 minutes that you're watching. All data is good data. So if it's only one bird, it's only one bird and that's fine. Um, you can enter the list right away using eBird, which I'll touch on a bit later, or you can enter online through a website and you have at least, I wanna say a week to put in your sightings to have it count towards the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so there is a little bit of wiggle room if you can't get your sightings in right away, but you'll want to try and get it in without within a few days. And you can absolutely participate more than once in those four days. Um, I try and participate every day in the count just because it's really fun to see what different birds you'll see every day. And you can count birds wherever you like. That's one of the things I love about the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's got backyard in the name, but you do not have to look 
keep it to your backyard. You can watch birds out your window while you're drinking your morning coffee. You can take a walk in your own backyard and see what's hanging out. You can watch from patios or porches. On If you live in the city, absolutely do account. Um, pigeons, starlings, house sparrows, you'll be surprised the amount of diversity that you can find in the city. And those are all birds that we wanna know about. So absolutely participate from the city and your neighborhood. You can go to parks, visit nature centers, truly, truly anywhere you can participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. Think of backyard in this sense being anywhere in the world if we were considering ourselves global citizens. We talked a little bit about why to participate, our benefits to us as educators, but just want to reiterate how fun and easy this project can be. And it really does connect you to nature. And it has some really amazing benefits for us as well. Uh, there's a little clipping of an article here that shows that experiencing biological diversity can invoke happiness. So getting out there and seeing birds, it's good for you. Um, and projects like these that run for a number of years collect really, really important data to science. They provide long-term records of birds that we can look at, we can notice trends as a population increasing or decreasing. So a project like the Great Backyard Bird Count is really, really important for noticing these larger population trends that help us make important conservation decisions. Plus, we scientists can't be everywhere all at once, and we can be the eyes and ears for scientists and tell them about what's happening in our own neighborhoods. And people do participate from anywhere, people of all levels, folks who are in it to win it with uh, cameras that I probably couldn't even carry because they look so heavy, to folks just going out for a walk, community groups together, um, all sorts of different folks are out there watching birds and counting and sharing them with us. So it's just a really awesome opportunity that folks from all over the world are participating in. And it's a great chance to feel like part of a global community. And you can you know, spend some time appreciating your own backyard too, which I really like. So that's a quick rundown on uh, some of how it works. I wanna tell you a little bit more about the sort of things that we learn from the Great Backyard Bird Count. So I mentioned that it's really important data to help us understand trends, but the Great Backyard Bird Count kind of helps us know a snapshot of where birds are in the winter. And it helps us see those year-to-year -year changes and long-term trends. And all of the data that we collect in Great Backyard Bird Count gets submitted through the eBird portal and can be used by folks who are using eBird to do research. And in 2022 alone, that data was used in over 170 publications. So this really is data that's being used. This is really important information and participating in the Great Backyard Bird Count makes you part of that. And there are a couple ways that you can participate. There's the Merlin Bird ID app, which I will give you a rundown of at the end of the webinar, and you can submit a sighting through that app. There's also the eBird app. This makes collecting your, your data really, really easy. It tracks the time and location and date all for you. Um, and you can just input birds as you see them and keep your running tally right there in the app and submit from the app and be done. Um, but these two apps together really are a powerhouse. So you can click on a bird, in Merlin and get to know it and say, yeah, that's the bird that I saw and share that sighting with eBird. Or if you're in eBird, you can click on a bird's name and then 
see the Merlin icon and look at a picture of that bird and be like, yeah, that's the one that I'm seeing. So they do communicate with each other now, which is really wonderful. But if you don't have access to technology or you um, don't want to use technology with your students, you can absolutely keep a paper checklist and then submit that information through the eBird portal. And I wanna share with you one other way that Great Backyard Bird Count can provide a really amazing learning opportunity. So there is a project called Birdability and this nonprofit is all about helping make birding accessible to everyone. Um, and so the Great Backyard Bird Count and Birdability have been partnering to help encourage people to map birding locations and fill out this assessment that will help folks who have mobility issues or know if that trail is accessible for them. So as educators, this can be a really cool way to build excitement around the Great Backyard Bird Count and around birding locations in your area. So you can visit, um, looks like the website's a little cut off there, but it's birdcount.org backslash birding dash for dash everybody. And that'll tell you a little bit more about birdability and, or you can visit the birdability website and download the checklist from there. And you could make it something that you do together as a class or a club um, to look at a birding site near you and help map it and help folks know if it would be a good location for them to visit. All right, so that is some ways that we can participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we as educators can help build our students up to, to participation in the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's a month away. You've got a little bit of time if you want to start building some skills to help your students be good citizen scientists. So I want to throw it out to you. What skills do you think? make a good citizen scientist. Curiosity, I'm seeing a lot. Awesome. Attention to detail, patience, using your senses, consistency, curiosity. I love that curiosity is coming up so much. Dedication, attention to detail, willingness to learn, ability to describe what you see. I like that. Collaboration, absolutely. Listening and respectfulness, passion. Passion doesn't hurt. <laughs> Yeah, I love, and I think kids are naturally curious. So I think many of our kids just need a little bit of encouragement to be excellent citizen scientists. So one of the other things that came out a lot was observation as a skill. And one of the ways I like to build up to participating in citizen science is by building observation skills, just some activities that get used to being outside and um, having their observation brains turned on. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit now about um, other activities that you can do to practice bird ID and how to get to know your local birds. And then I'll give you a rundown of um, the Merlin Bird ID app. So observation skills, we can think of observation as the ability to look closely. And I do think it is one of a scientist's most important tools. And there are lots of simple activities that we can do with our students to help build observation skills. One of my favorites and one of the simplest ones is just going outside and taking a rainbow hike. This is great for younger students good way to focus their observation skills. Kids can head outside, 
you can challenge them to find all the colors of the rainbow in nature. And you can expand on this activity by challenging them to draw some of what they find or take notes about some of the things they find. And so there's a real benefit to getting kids outside and practicing these skills before you do bird walks, because often the first time you take kids outside, they're just bundles of energy. They don't really have, um, they're just excited to be out there, right? So the focus isn't necessarily there. And so by doing activities like these as kind of an icebreaker for outdoor observation, you can help them you know, burn out that energy and get used to doing some activities like these outside. Another great activity to explore um, either independently or with guidance is our Explorer's Guidebook, which is available as a free download. And I'll ask um, Steph to share a link to that in the chat window. This is an activity guide. It's written at the fourth grade level. So if you're working with younger students, it might be more of a, a guided activity. Um, but older students can go through the activity book on their own. It's got six activities um, that are really great at building observation skills as well as bird ID skills. The first activity in the guidebook is another of my favorites for building outdoor observation skills. Um, it's a sound map. So you get kids outside and you challenge them to draw a map of every sound they hear. So on this little image here, X marks the spot where you're standing and then you draw around you using symbols or pictures or even words, what you're hearing. It's super fun doing this activity with kids and having them tune in to the sounds around them. Sometimes you'll hear um, not natural sounds. Like uh, I've heard the HVAC system on the building at work. And I was like, wow, I don't usually realize I'm hearing that until you stop and, and focus in. Um, fun hearing like chipmunk chipmunks run across the path like little things that you wouldn't expect to hear um it's also a really great skill to build for bird watching because often you you hear birds before you see them and there's lots of great ways you can deepen the learning um, and do fun discussion questions around activities like these also has a really classic um, habitat scavenger hunt just another great way of to get kids connecting to their local habitat and building their observation skills. So things like that can be really powerful ways to help kids get used to being outside, get used to using their observation skills um, and prepare them for participating in citizen science. Another resource that we have is our Cooped Up Kids activities. These are again, free activities. They're available online. I'll have Steph share a link to those in the chat window as well. Um, so these activities are Google slideshows that can be downloaded, shared through your own platform. Kids can go through them independently or with an adult facilitator. Um, and they're very They've got content and they've also got things that'll get you up and moving and practicing skills. So they're really fun and engaging. They cover a wide variety of topics um, from bird behavior and flight and migration to conservation and the benefits of birds. Um, but the one that interests us most right now, I think, is activity five, which is bird ID. So this is so this, uh, resource you could use and pull from to help your kids practice their bird ID skills, your students, before the, the Great Backyard Bird Count. And just to give you an idea of how we grade band these, um, we approach with the K2 students in the bird ID activity, uh, we approach it by using a storybook. Crow Not Crow, which is a fantastic book by Jane Yolen that's all about 
how to begin bird ID simply by telling something if something is a crow or not a crow. It just gets you practicing how to look at birds and talk about birds and um, what important what sorts of things are important when you're learning to identify them. And we do have a video of that book being read by our friend Leo at the lab um, available online and linked in the Cooped Up Kids activity. In three through five, we get into a little bit more depth. Um, we start talking about the four clues to bird ID, including size and shape, color pattern, behavior, habitat, and range. And it might be a little counterintuitive when you think about identifying birds, you probably think about their colorful, colorful plumage and their feathers. But ID experts will tell you that actually size and shape is one of the most important things to think about. And if you look at this image of a heron on the right, even when it's all blacked out like that, you can still tell it's a heron. It's got the characteristic long neck and the long beak and those long legs for waiting. So once you learn to look at the size and shape of a bird first, you can kind of put that bird into groups, which will then help you identify it by looking at more um, detailed aspects of it, like the color of its feathers. So just to illustrate what I mean, we've got a few silhouettes here and we could, theoretically put all of these into bird groups just by looking at their shape. So let's look at number two right here. Go ahead in the chat window. Let me know what group, group of birds you would say that silhouette represents. Duck, duck, duck. Can I get a goose? No, that's number five. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We've got our ducks. And how do we know? Well, we've got a really horizontal body. We've got webbed feet and a medium length neck. How about something a little harder, perhaps? Let's try number four. What group of birds would you call this? Now, some people, you could get really specific with this or you could go really broad with this. Passerine, a songbird, sure, approaching bird. Absolutely. Uh, I see a couple people guessing a type of thrush or robin. Um, and yes, I believe this was a, a robin. But yeah, songbird would be the category, the kind of broader category I would put that shape into. So you can start to see how just size, or excuse me, just the shape of a bird can kind of get you to a group of birds. And from there, you can continue on with your bird identification. And in our Cooped Up Kids activity, we then challenge kids to match the picture to the silhouette here. Um, so yeah, let's just do it for funsies. Which silhouette would you say our pictured blue jay matches? Upper left, upper right, lower right, or lower left? Upper left, yes, we can see that it's got an upright crest. It's kind of a chunkier bird. Over here on the right, we have a wider beak and a flatter crest, this is a cardinal. Down here, a smaller, skinnier bird with a shorter beak is a titmouse. And then this sleek bird here with the slick back crest would be a cedar waxwing. And then for our older groups, we take it a step further and dive into using Merlin on a number of birds pictured. So those activities are really great for working with different gray bands. You can find the level of difficulty and challenge that you're looking for. Another thing we like to do to help kids practice their bird ID skills is something called a focus bird. So you can assign each student in your class a bird to get to know. They can draw it and then they can add some cool information about it. You can challenge them to, for older kids, make a scientific drawing and provide labels for field marks. 
you can have them listen to their sounds the bird makes, add natural history notes on the back. So you can make these sort of mini bird reports. And by drawing them, kids get to know them very well. And then you have, you know, 25 little experts on their specific bird. So when you go out to do a bird walk, you've got a better shot at identifying what you see because hopefully there's an expert on what you see in your class. So this can be a great way to get started. Choosing the birds can be done um, based on your own knowledge, but also through Merlin. And I'll show you how to do that. In just a moment here. So yeah, you can put it all together and have your own little field guide. Now I am going to try to share my phone screen with you all. So give me a second as I transition over. Let's see, I'm gonna share screen with you. I think I need to go full screen here. There we go. Oops. Oh my gosh. We are trying to bring up this. We need to get rid of a bunch of things. Thought I cleared this all off for you before, but now you get to see all of my windows. Why won't this go away? There we go. All right. So hopefully now you are seeing my desktop. And on the right side, you're hopefully seeing Merlin. If somebody could give me a little um, thumbs up in the chat window, that would be great. Awesome. Okay. So let's go ahead and see how we can use Merlin. I have a bird pictured here for us to identify. So we're going to use the start bird ID function. This is going to um, ask us five simple questions to help us identify our bird. And I'm going to go ahead and say current location. And I'm going to say today because we are acting as if we went birding today in this area. And then we're going to try and answer these prompts based on the bird on my screen here. So this bird, the first thing we have to answer is size. And that can be a little bit challenging in a picture because things aren't to scale, but it looks like it's on a branch to me. And based how zoomed in we're, we are, I think it's probably a pretty small bird. So we could either go sparrow sized, which you'll see here, or sparrow sized um, between sparrow and robin. So this bird scale, is a sparrow, robin, crow, and goose. And then you just kind of pick where you think it is on the scale between those things. Um, and I'll go, I'll go with sparrow size because I think it's a pretty small bird based on this picture. And I'll hit next. Next, we can choose what are the three main colors. So you can choose up to three colors. So looking at this bird, for example, I would choose black, blue and white and then hit next and then it's going to ask you what was the bird doing was it eating at a feeder swimming or wading on the ground in trees or bushes on a fence or wire soaring or flying and i'll say trees or bushes because we can see it's on a branch right here and hit next and then it's going to come up with a list of possible birds that we might have seen um So we can see it came up with several possibles here. There's about one, two, three, four, five. But if we look here, our top option, it looks like that's pretty good for it. If I were on my phone, I could swipe through different pictures of here, but just through the function of sharing through my computer, can't quite do that. Um, but usually when you're doing this, you want to look for like three points of agreement to make sure that you're 
pretty close here. So we've got this cute little black cap on both of them. We've got the white face on both of them and this bluish grayish back. And I'm even seeing some of this kind of rufousy color under the tail on both of them too. So then we could um, hit the info if we wanted to learn more about this bird. We could listen to sounds and see a map. Um, and then if we were confident that this was our bird, we could hit, this is my bird. And then it will provide you with the option to um, share that sighting through eBird. So you could, that that's one way you could report a sighting on Global Big Day. I'm gonna X out of this and not save it either way, just because we didn't actually see this bird in this location today. Um, and I don't wanna create any false data. So I'm going to hit the home button here in the right hand corner and we're going to go back to some other options here. I'm going to go to explore birds. This is how I would create a list of birds that I want my students to get to know and create their focus bird drawings about. Um, and how I'm going to do that is I'm going to go to the menu option here in the upper right corner in um, iPhone, I think it looks like the slider uh, menu option. I have an Android, so it looks like the little kind of hamburger style menu. And what we're going to do is change how it's filtered. So it's automatically goes to bird packs. We're going to change it to likely birds. And then we're going to change the location. Uh, we're going to go Ithaca. And we're going to say today. And then we're going to change it to most likely birds. And then when we do that, it's going to provide us with a list of birds we are most likely to see if we go outside today. And you can see um, a bunch of common winter birds listed here. You can scroll down. You could choose um, birds from this list to give your students to get to know. So that can be really useful. And if I wanted to know, is that gonna be the same when the Great Backyard Bird Count is happening, I can change the date to be that Friday that it starts, the 17th of February, and we'll see if that changes the list any. Not much, but Chickadee went from number one to number two, or number two to number one. <laughs> so you can plan ahead as well using this feature, which makes it great for educators. Now, if I head back to our main options here. The last thing I want to show you is sound ID. So we're going to go ahead and give that a try. And I have the call of the white breasted nuthatch that we're looking at here set up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press play on this and then I'll start the recording here. What I want you to watch for when it's going is for a name to pop up on screen. And then every time the app hears that bird again, the name will light up. So you'll be able to tell every time it's hearing it. So keep an eye out for that. So every time it's hearing a bird, you'll notice that blue dot there too. So you'll know if it's hearing what you're hearing. So there we go. That is our white-breasted nuthatch call. Um, oops. So one of the things I recommend you do when you are using Merlin Sound ID is that you check out the IDs it gives you just because the way that Merlin works, it actually turns sound into a visualization like this right here that we're looking at um, is the spectrogram, the visualization of the bird's call. And then it uses computer visioning to identify that visualization. So every once in a while, it might come up with a bird that isn't usually in your area or is rare. 
And so it just is beneficial to listen to the birds that it suggests and make sure you agree. So we'll practice what we preach and listen to the white breast and nut hatch. And that sounds like a good match to me. And then from here, you could click on the white breast and nut hatch. Um, go to explore and other nearby birds. You could then use the eBird app to enter it as a bird that you've seen. It's just a really great jumping off point for starting to identify birds by sound. So that is Merlin in a nutshell. Um, and it's just a really powerful tool to use with students and help them feel really successful in building their bird ID skills from the get-go. Another resource that is available to you is allaboutbirds.org. And actually, why don't we visit the website instead? We will go to allaboutbirds.org is kind of the lab's online field guide. So you can type in birds here. We're just gonna do white breast and nuthatch because we've got a theme going on and hit go and it will take you to information about the bird. This is a, something that I use with students because it's got cool facts on there. It's got life history. Um, this is a great way to have them fill in the information for their um, focus bird that we talked about earlier. So there's lots of great info in here. If you don't have smartphones with your kids, um, there is a version of Merlin that you can find right here um, under the bird ID option and that will pop open. It's just that first one we went through with the five questions, but it can be useful for when you're practicing bird ID or watching birds out the window, that sort of thing. It, it can be pretty fun to play with. Um, a great way to get your kids used to using those functions too, um, if you only have a limited amount of smart devices that kids are gonna be sharing, everybody can practice using it. So that's a great resource for you as well. Now we are running up on time here, so I'm gonna open the floor to questions. And I did see that I missed several while we were going, so I'll see if I can catch back up with those. Hey Kelly, I chat on the chat. I sent you all the questions. Awesome. Direct message to you. Perfect. Okay, so I'm seeing there was a question about if you continue to monitor for more than 15 minutes, do you need to break up your data? Um, and the answer to that is no. So you can count for as long as you want. eBird itself prefers if checklists are around an hour versus, you know, an all day long, just because it's more useful for them. But um, as far as the great backyard bird count goes, as long as you count for 15 minutes, you can certainly go for longer. You don't have to break that into intervals. So Jennifer was wondering about doing the Great Backyard Bird Count with a group of kids. Would they all join separately? Great question. I'm assuming you mean would they all need to like submit a separate list? Um, if you are out birding as a group, you're going to want to submit only one list for that group of kids. If they then go home and do a count on their own, then they could submit that. I will say eBird is not COPA compliant, so they'd have to be 13 years old or older to um, have an account themselves. But one of the ways we work around that is teachers can create group accounts. So create a login specifically for your class with an email and a password that you don't mind sharing with them. Um, and then they can submit through eBird. But again, if you're with a group, you can have 
multiple people keeping a checklist, but at the end, we advise that you come together and you create a, a shared checklist, a group checklist where you talk about the numbers that everybody saw and do your best estimate on like the, you could take the average or if somebody saw five and somebody saw four, you might go with the higher count or the lower count, depending on how you want to approach it. So Frederick was asking about identifying birds and how to keep the most accurate scientific data. So hopefully the Merlin tool will help you um, identify birds. If you don't have Merlin, field guides are a great way to go. Um, there's, it just takes a little bit of practice to identify birds. Um, I generally recommend that you start with just a few birds that you get to know pretty well. And then once you're comfortable with identifying those, it becomes a lot easier to learn more because you have something to compare them to. When it comes to keeping your data accurate enough for a project like this, you really need to, we're focusing on two areas, right? Your best, the identification to the best of your ability and the count to the best of your ability. So identification to the best of your ability um, is somewhat subjective, right? Because if you're just starting out, you might not have um, built up a ton of skills around bird ID, but you're still gonna be reporting to the best of your ability. eBird has a ton, a ton of checks and balances in the background. So if you are doing your level best and a really, you know, you're doing an honest job at trying to identify birds and doing your best to identify what you see as accurately as you can, um, you're not really going to mess up the database. And mistakes do happen, but, you know, just do to your best of your ability. So I see there's a question about the stats from past counts. Um, were you looking for uh, that in like the, an email? Was this st the stats that I gave on the slides with that? what you were looking for. Yeah, Kathleen, if you can expand on what you were looking for regarding stats a little bit more. Monique's asking, if you do Project Feeder Watch, is it okay if the numbers overlap or keep them separate? Um, so Project Feeder Watch actually uses different protocols. So you only submit the maximum number of a species that you see at one time versus Great backyard bird count, which you went in which you are submitting your best estimate of total numbers. So it would just be slightly different. Um, if you were doing the counts at the same time, but submitting them in the to the different places, that would be fine as long as you were following the proper protocol for each project. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I have a question about what the difference is between Merlin and eBird app. So Merlin is the bird identification app. So we, you saw the options when we went through there. eBird is the bird sighting app. So you log the birds that you see through eBird. Um, but they complement each other because Merlin will help you identify the birds, but you log your sightings through eBird. So that's where you put the types of species you see and the number of each one that you see. Anne's asking about identifying birds in West Africa. Oh, fabulous question. Um, I showed Merlin for the United States and Canada. That's the pack that I have. But Merlin has packs for, I don't remember the number of countries now, but it's a large, large chunk of the world. So when you download Merlin, it's actually a two-part download. The first one is downloading the app. And then when you open it, you get to choose a bird pack. So, and you might find that there is a bird pack for West Africa. And then the skills that I showed you for navigating Merlin will be the same, but it'll just be loaded with the birds for that area.
Kimberly's asking if there's a sheet for kids to record an unknown signing to get back to the group later, like a version of the five questions in a worksheet. So um, in the section when I was sharing resources with you, I mentioned the Explorer's Guidebook. That has a section that basically runs through on paper the Merlin bird ID questions and also has a place for kids to sketch their bird that they're seeing. So I would recommend downloading that and you could just print out that those two pages back in front and you would have that little sheet to hand out to kids. Moira's asking if you plan to divide your class into groups to observe birds at the same park, should you compile the data and submit as one entry? Or should you have each group enter the data separately? Fantastic question. Um, the answer is depends, which I'm, I'm sure is not as clear and precise as you would like. So if they're all in essentially the same area of the park, like within eyesight of each other, I would say have them submit one list, create a class list. If kids are separated enough that they're in different areas of the park or different habitats or can't see each other, which means they might be seeing different birds, you could submit different lists. We just don't want multiple of identical lists submitted, if that makes sense. Um, so I would say you're looking for your dividing line here is going to be whether they're likely to be seeing the exact same birds or not. So if it's different habitats or they're far enough apart, you might do separate lists. Um, a question about photo ID on Merlin. Yes, that's, you can absolutely use that. I didn't show it because I've never took an, taken a good enough photo with my phone <laughs> to use uh, the bird ID function on, but some people will take a picture on a nicer camera and then take a picture with Merlin of the display screen and have used it successfully that way. Um, and I don't know if it saves the picture to your phone or not. Um, so I'm not sure how you would go about deleting it. It might save save it in its own folder. I'd have to poke around to answer that better for you. Okay, so there's a question up from Chris about their school beginning a bird study to prepare for great backyard bird count. And do I recommend individual classrooms entering the data or should you enter as a school? Good question. Um, it depends a little bit. So um, if everybody in the school is out there observing at the same time in the same area, that would be one list. If different classrooms are going out in different times, there would be separate lists. I suspect you might be asking more about accounts though. Like, do you have to have one school account versus multiple classroom accounts? You could go either way in that case. So if you wanted to compile the data of the whole school um, and look at it that way, you could have a school group account. But if you were more interested in like, comparing what one classroom sees to another classroom or you want one one classroom or one teacher wants to be able to use their specific data to dive into and graph and things like that then then you would want to have separate accounts for the classrooms i hope i hope that answers your question So there's a question about what app are you using for the Great Backyard Bird Count? I thought it was Merlin. So Merlin is the bird ID app. You can submit a sighting through eBird. Merlin will send you to eBird, but Merlin is bird ID. To submit data, you're gonna use the eBird app or make a paper checklist and submit through the eBird portal online 
or if you go to um, birdcount.org, which is the Great Backyard Bird Count website, I think they link to the portal where you can submit your data. I'll also, um, Steph, if you could find the link to the educator section of the Great Backyard Bird Count, I'm not sure it's in the list of links I gave you. Um, yes, I'll put it right away. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I would recommend checking that out. If you, are, if I was a little unclear, that's going to help you um, figure out how to participate as well. Just kind of reinforce some of the things we talked about. There's a link. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also put the two links about the binocular question. So I, I linked the binocular for kids website, a website, and the one for. Um, full size binoculars. Awesome. Oh, I noticed that we have gone over time. Thank you so much, Steph, for sharing those links. Um, and I saw somebody ask a question about letters of completion for this webinar. Um, currently, we are providing that through a link that you can download and fill your information in and have that letter. So, Steph, I, sh I shared that with you. I already um, put it in the chat. Yeah. Oh, you're so on top of it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, cool. You can copy it again in case someone missed it. I'm just scrolling through the chat window and I'm like 27 minutes behind or messages behind. So, <laughs> uh, and I think okay. you're good with the questions. Awesome. Yeah, the certificate and the binoculars were it. Yeah. Perfect. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I hope that you participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count and have an amazing time. Really appreciate your time uh, and hope to see you in a future webinar. Thank you so much and enjoy counting birds this February.